Zora is happy to do the tedious stuff for Stamets. Michael has a broker friend on Parathia. And Glowworm wins a game of Leonian poker with radical looking cards. Hello, everybody, and welcome to <laughs> the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and I meant it when I said radical cards. I want to talk about those cards for just a second. Today, we're doing a review of Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 8, entitled All In. We also would like to give a very special thanks to our friend, Mr. Jim Martins. Thank you very much. And special thanks to you. How are you doing, Strock? Let's talk about this episode. I'm doing good. Doing good. How about you? Good. It's a windy day in uh, Southern California's beautiful San Fernando Valley, but we power through. We, it's 80 <laughs> degrees and windy in, in windy. February. <laughs> Boy, do we have it tough nowadays. Um, okay, you know what? Actually, what's the most important thing? Number one, doesn't matter what any episode of any show does from here on out. The highlight of the year is Eisenberg class being mentioned in the first 20 seconds of the episode. Yes. That was the highlight of this episode right away. They got to it. That's cool. Not only to know that the U there was the USS Nog last season. And then you look it up and it says it's an Eisenberg class. So first of all, Nog is mentioned. It's an Eisenberg class or not Nog is shown Eisenberg class, which was already great and wonderful and a, and a beautiful way to honor our good friend, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. But today they actually verbalized it. It was actually part of the script. And there are people in that writer's room that are looking over our friend, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. And hopefully he's looking over us and get, he, he would have gotten such a kick out of that, wouldn't he? Yes, he would have. And for that reason alone, I'm going to say only good things about this episode because they did knock it out of the park by giving a, a nice tribute to the late, great Aaron Eisenberg. And it's always great to see that, you know, that, his impact and his memory is, is, is still, is, is still being celebrated. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's always, it's always a good uh, tribute when you get to see something like that. I'm I was very happy. Yes. Yeah, so much. So his impact is felt so much so that even in the writer's room, they're like, how can we incorporate him visually, you know, uh, in the lore and verbally so that's really cool. And I'm sure, you know, we're, we're allowed to say that on Aaron's behalf, thank you. That's really cool. And on, you know, on behalf of Aaron's fans and friends yeah. and all Star Trek fans, we also want to say thank you. That's really cool. It doesn't go unnoticed, especially the people that knew what that meant right away. I'm sure everybody was very happy and touched by that. Really cool. So um, also... Those uh, those poker cards. I wasn't kidding. I, I really thought that was those were cool. Like when they showed a close up of those poker cards, I was like, wow, those are really cool little designs. Like there was like the shape that was kind of like this on them that showed. And it made me for the first time recognize the props department. You know, like we always recognize the visual effects. The music and scoring is great. The makeup is great. Obviously, we, we get all that. But this was the first time I was like. Wow, very creative props department. I don't know why it was a poker card that got me to think that, but it really was. I thought the same thing too. I thought that was original because I don't know if I've ever seen a poker card that didn't have the traditional diamond heart club spade on it, right? Mm. Um, or a deck of any playing cards. So the fact that they altered that and made it some kind of unusual shape and even the shape of the card itself was uh, was different. It wasn't like a, a rectangle like we're norm normally used to seeing. Um, I thought that was cool. That was one of the things that I enjoyed the most and um, made me think, well, these guys are, this show, they're playing poker, they're, they're doing mushrooms. I'm <laughs> like, this is, a, <laughs> this is a real cool show right here. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought that to myself, but was it was actually good because wasn't there I, I was looking for um star trek t-shirts online not too long ago 
And one of the ones that popped out and caught my attention was a next generation t-shirt with a bunch of poker cards on it. And mm-hmm. I think it was called oh. Royale. Is it Royale or the Casino? Casino, Casino Royale, was, Royale. It was, it was a movie, I think, back in the day. Yeah. Well, it was a uh, it was a Star Trek shirt and it had yeah. um, the next generation cast. Was it a shot looking they've... down on them or what? No, it was actually the cards themselves, the faces of the cards. So I think uh, Worf oh, I was see. like a jack of spades. And, you know, the, each person was a, a different actual card. Itself. Got it. That's cool. OK. That's I don't cool. know what episode that was. Well, see, what I was thinking um, was that it might be uh, if it actually showed them playing card. It was just a, a, a scene in which they were playing poker because they did that a lot. And if the card was there then it would have only been a reference to the, the very final scene of the last episode of Star Trek, the next generation, but it wasn't those. Uh, so it was just like a card where they were the characters on the cards. I get it now. Yeah. Okay. Really cool shirt. I like, I like it. I'm going to see if I can find it here and pull it up if I can, mm-hmm. but was there were, there were a lot of instances where they played poker on uh, next generation. Yeah. It was kind of their thing. Um, it was really beautiful because it was kind of where, you know, some like there was Quark's bar for Deep Space Nine. Well, for Next Generation, they had 10 forward, but the senior staff also would play poker nights sometimes. And Riker was like the shark, you know, the poker shark. Data was the dealer because, you know, he, you know, he's a robot, an android. Um, and it was just fun because there were, it was interesting character developments and character reveals in those card games. And there was a really good one with uh, cause and effect. One of my favorite episodes ever that just had the same thing over and over again. It changed a lot. I don't want to get too much into that because it's really good. And in case you ever see it, I don't want to spoil it, but anyway, so okay. poker poker is definitely a thing for next generation. Yeah. For next generation, yeah, that's the the shirt that I saw. And it was a really cool shirt. Now that I, now that I'm looking for it, I'm, I think I'm going to go buy it because it is something kind of rare. But yeah, I thought the, uh, you know, this show Discovery has by far the best set design that I've ever yeah. seen on a Star Trek show. It's not even, it's not even close. I don't think uh, when you look at the visuals and the background and the sets, it's not even close. The stuff looks as good as it gets as far as yeah. set design, as far as modern, uh, the futuristic feel to it. I mean, it feels like I'm on a spaceship. You know, I was even noticing that in, in, and I put in my notes, I even noticed that in Michael Burnham's quarters, which were pretty plain, pretty plain, pretty simple, just regular quarters. But I noticed in the yeah. background, like three or four little trinkets, like a vase here or something. And they just looked really elegant and really interesting and classy and i was just like it's interesting because usually you would notice you know production design and and set decoration you know when there's a lot going on and you're like wow there's so much cool stuff but sometimes in its simplicity and its classiness like it tells a story too and that's where i noticed it in this episode there's you know you know a couple scenes in her in her quarters and i was just like wow that's really cool like Sometimes it's just those, the little things that catch your attention, you know? Uh, so I want to second that. I also want to mention that we heard a new alien race, the Stilf. You mentioned the Stilf. I don't think we've Is ever it seen Stilf it. or Stilf? A Stilf with a T-H. P- I, I had it P-H. down as Stilf. I believe it's P-H, Stilf. Okay. But okay. I could be wrong. <clears throat> I don't think we'd ever heard of them before, so... We'll keep an eye out and keep our ears open for if they ever mention them again. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to mention another new ish, a new alien. Maybe, maybe he was a stilf for all we know has now this guy has, um, uh, extra. What was it? What was his place called? I don't remember, but, uh, the karma barge. Yeah. The karma barge. Uh, the funny thing was, though, was the way a uh, book mentioned it that I had no idea what he was saying, because with the British accent, he was like, 
Haas is calm, Abage, you know, or something like that. <laughs> but then I looked at the the subtitles because I always keep the subtitles on to, to see the new alien races and stuff like that. And it said Karma Barge. And I'm like, if I hadn't had that, I would have just thought it was like, you know, like a comma barge, like the rock the Casbah or whatever, you know, like just a, a thing to call it. <laughs> but another thing that was interesting was has called himself has. Everyone else called him Haas. So I'm like, which one is it? I, I usually go by what the person calls themselves, but if they all agree that his name is Haas, maybe he's the wrong <laughs> one that's wrong. But he was great. The, the writing for yeah. him was awesome. The acting, this guy, I got to look him up, is clearly a seasoned character actor because yeah. this guy gets it. He knows when to whisper. He knows when to smirk. He knows when to add something to a line. He knows when to just kind of casually use it as a throwaway line. Whoever this guy is, beautiful. And the writing for him was awesome. Yeah, I thought his performance was fantastic. There were there were just uh, subtleties there all up and down this episode. Uh, the interaction he had with Book and with Burnham, you could see the familiarity he had with them. A lot of, uh, yeah. you know, insight kind of jokes in between them or or like, oh, I'm not playing that. This is how it's going to go. He had a lot of, uh, I would say, kind of a quirk type of master of ceremony type of interesting yeah. ambiance to his, his being, his persona, like larger than life and kind of like, I'm the master of this show. This you're in my domain, kind of like, you know, being at Quark's bar. This is my show. This is how it goes. Uh, I felt a lot of an element of that. Um, and I love the negotiation scenes that he was having with everybody. Like, you know, hey, you know, it's, a, it's up for grabs, really. I, you can't tell me I can't sell it. The hell I can. I'll sell it to whoever I want to sell it to. Um, I thought he was great. I actually took time out to do a little artistic work on him. This is Haas. what we got to see. That's my rendition of the, the Haas band. Wow. And it. you also got the guy with the ram's horn, too. Yeah, because of the Rams are playing in the Super Bowl. I figure we just uh, hype up on the Rams. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's really good. Actually, that looks a little bit like it reminds me of um, the Krill on the Orville, actually. But I thought the makeup on Haas has was really good. Uh, I, yeah. I, I think the whole character, that's an A plus character. The acting, the, the makeup, the writing, the fact that he had all these funny sayings. Remember, he said the first funny saying, and you're like, what the heck is this guy talking about? But you get it. You're like, okay, he's just got weird sayings because he's a different. I think he said, but Jabba Brussels fry. <laughs> I can't even say it. Jabba <laughs> Brussels fly. Where did, where did <laughs> <What is it? laughs> Jabba Brussels fly, and I'll scoot some green bread, right? It just took me three tries to say that. This guy said it as if he said it a thousand times. Jab a Brussels fly and I'll scoot some green bread or something like, <laughs> and those are the kind of things that make me rewind and play back where I'm like, this guy's saying something unnatural, but saying it mm -hmm. naturally. And the writers just gave him clearly a seasoned actor, something to play with, you know, actors would love nothing more than interesting and fun lines like that, where you can just really, sink your teeth into and say, okay, I get it. He's this guy from a completely different culture. He uses these sayings. He has his fun. What, what a, what a playground, you know, for a, for an actor to play in, I think. Yeah. I think he's a great character. He's somebody that I wouldn't mind seeing a lot more of because yeah. he just has so much personality uh, and he's so charming. And, you know, we always hear when we interview guests, who wear prosthetics, how difficult it is to act in all that makeup. And he was able to just hit it all out of the park, even though he had this really big his, uh, restrictive headpiece on, he barely see anything, but just his eyes. Yeah. Um, and even though, even still, he played all the moments with his eyes very well, I thought. Um, and he was the kind of guy where you're like, I know he's kind of ended bad things, but I kind of like him. And I, you know, it's like, I know he's a, like a, you know, deals in the, the black market and he's all into underground 
you know, buying and selling and trading. But yeah, but he's a cool I guy. Kinda, he's kind of chill. He's a cool guy. He's not bothering anybody. Mm. He kind of like you expected him to be a big bad mob boss type, but he was more just like, hey, you know, whatever. We're just you know, just doing my hustle. You're doing yours. No big deal. You know, we're all friends here until we're not. So we're not. Um, and he actually reminded me of uh, uh, Hellboy. Oh, interesting. Ron Perlman's Hellboy. Ron who, Perlman's by the way, Hellboy. whose sidekick was Abe Sapien, played by Mr. Doug Jones. You see how that all ties in together? Beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, there were, there were uh, Hellboy-ish moments. That kind of bravado, that kind of charm little bit of a Hellboy thing as your pinky goes up in the air in confirmation. Um, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to mention was that ship that I thought was really cool. That kind of serpenty dragon ship that was in the water. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was a cool. I don't know if we've ever seen something in the water before. We're usually in space. We're usually in the air or on a, on a, or on a ground base. But we've I've seen never seen us... We've in seen water. things then things that are supposed to be in the water in space, like a gormagander, a space whale. But yeah, that was the first time that I can think of where we got to see that cool visual of you know some kind of like serpent going. You know, it almost looked like uh, at least the body of you know like a Chinese New Year kind of serpent. You yeah, know what I mean that's what I thought. I wrote and it, it looked down, really Chinese cool. dragon. Yeah. yeah, it looked like a Chinese dragon. And Loved what I it. thought was cool was about it was as the mouth opened and they're flying into it. I'm like, okay, where is this going to go? And and then the hologram dissipates and you see yes. what it is, what it is for it, you know, as the ship that it is. I thought that was another uh, great special effects, visual effects uh, moment for, for Star Trek. I agree. It's very smart, uh, very good concept and really well executed. Like when I see stuff like that, there's like, even though it's only a few seconds, I have this whole thought process of it's coming up. The first thing I think, and I think a lot of people think is, ooh, cool. I hope we see more of this thing. And then it comes up a second time and you're like, oh, good. Because what you don't like is these things where you're like, oh, that, there was like this little thing that just popped up for a second and they're saving money. So that's all you saw. You know, you're like, we yeah. want to see more of whatever this thing is. And they show it a second time and then a third time. And then it comes up and it's also not just gratuitous, but it's a reveal into part of the storyline. So yeah, that's another A plus moment. Beautifully executed, beautifully, beautifully conceptualized, I thought too. It looked awesome and it's exactly what we want. We want to see cool, interesting new things, you know? Yeah, and uh, once again, hats off to the set design guys because they had to come up with the whole ship design for that particular place mm. um, for the you know this Karma Barge. And I and I was with you when I first heard it. I put Karma Bosch, Karma Bosch. What, what is that? I, <laughs> his accent kind of mucked it up for me. And I it only only until it came on later, I, I didn't see it with the subtitles. So, but somebody, I think Burnham said it later on in the episode. And that's when I understood it to be the Karma Barge. Um, it was, yeah, uh, it's Has Mazzaro's Karma Barge. But the but it was so funny the way Book said it. He said, "Welcome to Has Mazzaro's Karma Barge," or something, something like that. To us, like, <laughs> well, that was a mouthful, and I have no idea what we just said. But then I looked at the subtitles. So I was like, "Oh, Karma Barge, I get it." British accent. Okay. And I, I wonder if the British people are like, oh, a comma barge. Of course, a comma barge. Oh, <laughs> obviously. <of course>. How's <laughs> Mazar? <laughs> yes. Um, but no, I, I was lost uh, just like you. And, and I actually, speaking of names being pronounced differently, Awasakun yeah. had a different pronunciation this episode too. Awosh, yeah, she's pronouncing it. So presumably this is the correct way to say it. Awoshikun, right? It looks like right. Awasakun, but it's Awoshikun, right? Now, right. even, was it Tarka? Even Tarka said her name differently. He said, yes. like, it was, it was almost like he was just like, sometimes words just don't work with you. The when you, you know... 
And clearly he was having problems with it because he said, oh, oh, she gong. like he kind of made it like a, a guttural and 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 he did it twice. Both times he pronounced her name. And I was like, I, I feel you, man. Like sometimes <laughs> sometimes there's just a block where you're like. I'm saying it this way. That that's that's it. That's I'm just saying this word this yeah. way. Sorry. <laughs> well, she- and we get that a lot in Star Trek. We get that a lot because, you know, when you when you get the script and I don't know if that's the same is true for today as it, it was back then, but we'd get the script and there whatever words or names that were unusual or foreign to us were written in a pronunciation guide on the uh, opening yep. pages of the script. So you would be able to go through and, and, and I don't know if anybody looks at that, by the way, <laughs> just, they, really should. The they put it, they put they it should. in the episode. Somebody put in the time and effort yeah. for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and literally everybody just kind of goes past that page and finds where their lines are. And, and, <laughs> and thus we get to a, a place where everybody pronounces words differently because they didn't actually look at the pronunciation guide or sit down and say, hey, guys, we're going to all pronounce it like this. So it's kind of, you know, every man for himself in, in that regard when you're filming. Speaking of that, didn't he say... Didn't didn't he say something like a saying like every man for himself, but he said every man, woman. What what was the the line that he said? Oh, well, I can't remember it. Uh, uh, for the, for the poker game, you mean? It was like right right before the poker. Mm. Some people that are watching right now know what I'm talking about. It was like a. To, oh yeah, I think it was to each his, her, or their own, something like that. I think that's what it was. It was, uh, a, it was a different play on, on an old saying just to be more inclusive there. And then you, you okay. figure like, oh, well, in the future, you know. And then he's like, all the things. <laughs> he's just like, let's just, you know, all the stuff. It, to everything its own. <laughs> <It's moving. laughs> you, you get what it's I'm moving. saying here. Also, that yeah. big dude's name was Otto Kerr. Um, who's that uh, the big Steve, dude Steve Kerr's brother um, Otto Otto Kerr he was the, the big dude that fought Awashikun Owash- um, and dropped her ass a couple times but we knew she would, they were playing okay. the con they were, they were playing the con game she's like oh you beat me well we'll do it again oh you beat me again okay now bet all the money and I'll, I'll win 45 to 1 <laughs> That's a hustle. Yeah, um, I thought it was interesting. They brought up this. Uh, I'm looking it up now. This the Faraday cage. Yeah, they like, mentioned oh, like that. A cage. Yeah, so and I remember studying about Faraday cages and seeing miniature versions of them all over the place. But um, so I just thought it was interesting. They brought up the Faraday cage. It's uh, reminds me of Brookstone going to Brookstone, <laughs> looking at that little the book thing the that bookstore? had the. No, uh, Brookstone. Brookstone was like a a gadget store in the mall that would always. Oh have, yes, yeah. Like like massage chairs, as and, seen and on TV. Things. Yeah, that kind of stuff. And they would have this globe thing that when you touched it, electric, you know, like yes. purple electricity would just come to wherever you touched it. Mm-hmm. That's what I re- what I thought of when they said uh, the Faraday cage line. You know, I want to point out, I mentioned earlier when Haas, the actor, by the way, I looked up on IMDb and it's not filled out yet. So I don't know who the actor is. I suppose I'm sure the actors mentioned, you know, there's a line with his name somewhere in uh, the credits of the episode. But there was a moment where, you know, they're saying something. I think I think Michael Burnham says we'd like to examine the product first to make sure it's all good. And he goes, fair enough. Or whatever. He just, he just two lines. Yeah. And he whispers it. And I was immediately like, I put in my notes. I said, this guy gets it. He knows when to whisper. Like I keep catching myself being, being taught lessons by these great actors on discovery where you're like, that, that was a choice, you know, like he just decided this is how I'm going to deliver it. And it just, added so much i mean this guy is only going to be in probably one episode ever yet somehow he's figured out a way to be memorable which is not easy to do 
to have a memorable per- performance. Cause I mean, like if you're just there for one week or two weeks, you could just be like, okay, well, by the time he's actually got the character down, a lot of people, they don't have the character down for a, an entire season, but these day players have to have the character down from day one. And it's so hard to do. It's, it's a really a thankless job that, that, you know, these day players do this. It's amazing to me. I thought he was, uh, I have to second what you're saying. The guy was spectacular in this episode um, for coming in in a one, one off. Then his first time we've seen him, he left a huge impact, carried pretty much the bulk of the episode in the scenes that he was in. Mm. I thought, and, um, and like you said, those, those subtleties, those little moments, there was a moment. It was like, what you sensed from him, at least what I did, is that he wasn't on anybody's side. Like he wasn't for anybody. He was just for himself. That's like a tree beard quote. When the hobbits say, whose side are you on? And he says, side? I'm not on anybody's side because nobody is on my side. But whatever. That's the Lord of the Rings thing. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that was the that was the the, the you know the yeah. energy that I got from him. It was like, you know, when book comes around, hey, my man, book. When Burnham came around, hey, Burnham, what's up? Little. And then he didn't even tell <laughs> yeah. them right away that book was there. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Even like, though whatever. he knew that they were together, he he knows that they're 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 together, right? I mean, he he has knowledge of that because I think there was some mention of that. He did mention. Um, that when book first came in, he mentioned like, Hey, how's Burnham doing or something like that. Something about his girl. Um, I thought that was cool that he didn't mention them, that they were, each other were there. And that was another moment too, where uh, Burnham didn't have enough latinum for the transaction she wanted. And she's like, well, I'll just make a phone call and call, uh, you know, let me call Starfleet and get, get some more latinum, you know, sent over. And the way he said, uh, uh, no, nah, I, we don't need, I don't need Starfleet coming over here. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> like, no, no. Nah, nah. <laughs> the way yeah. he shut that down was just classic to me. I was like, oh, that's. It brought like, up. It brought up something interesting to me. And I feel like I feel like we've been squabbling about this since the dawn of time. Uh, Star Trek fans. That is. Starfleet doesn't deal with money. They don't. They've eliminated money. The Federation doesn't use money. So how do they keep having latinum? Where do they get it, right? They, they clearly have to get the latinum from something, right? In, in order to get it, they have to sell goods or they have to trade goods so that they have it so that when they're dealing with other races, they have this latinum to deal with those other races. Okay, so they are dealing with money. They, do have, they, don't, they don't deal with money amongst themselves, but they are selling and trading goods for money so that they can use it when dealing with other people that use money. Well, that's the same thing we do today amongst friends. Sometimes you're our families, you're giving stuff back and forth. You're not dealing with money, but in cases where these people, you go to the grocery store, they're like, I don't know you, (laughs) you have to give me money. (laughs) We go, okay, well, I happen to have some money that I got from exchanging work. So I don't know. It's just always an interesting thing where it's like, we say that they don't deal with money in the future in the Federation, but they do. They, they have to. They have no choice because they're still outside forces out there. But I also wanted to point out Boronite, when they found out that the big DMA thing that's 228 million kilometers in radius, that's uh, mm-hmm. 456 million kilometers in diameter, That's 332 miles. I'm just kidding. I don't know how many miles, but something (laughs) like that. I don't know. I'm not going that fast with the miles thing, miles conversion, but somewhere around 250 mile million miles across. Anyway, um, they mentioned they're basically mining for boronite. Now, boronite has been mentioned one time before in Star Trek, and that was on Star Trek Voyager. I don't remember the episode. The Borg used boronite, I believe, to make this omega particle, which is like the purest whatever thing. Um, I'm sure if I check the Don Crandall notes, he's going to give better notes than I have on this. 
But basically, when they mentioned Boronite, Star Trek fans, the first thing they thought is this has been mentioned before in reference to the Borg. So this may be the Borg 800 years into the future mining for mm. Boronite, which could be a very dangerous thing. Yeah, they're keeping this mystery on us. And um, yeah, it could be. And now that you mentioned that, they did they did say, well, well, if this is their mining device, then what are their weapons like? Which is, you know, a scary kind of thought there. Um, yeah, I, I know nothing of Boronite. I, I was looking it up to see. I found Boronite, which mm. is one of these uh, minerals, an ore of copper. Um, That's like when you're watching but, a movie you don't like. It's a bore night. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I don't know if it's the uh, Boronite. Is there's a, there's a company called the American Boronite Company, which is oh, that's cool. Uh, funny. Okay, so um, looking at Don Crandall's notes for us very quickly before we go to the free for all, he says they mention Alasians, um, and that was a species from the classic original series episode. Ellen of Troyes. That is a very well-known episode. There's a lady dressed up uh, in a very iconic outfit that a lot of people like to cosplay. Actually, let me show you right now. Here's the cosplay. So everybody, when you see this cosplay at conventions, you know that is Ellen of Troyes. Um, but that's from that episode. E-L-A-A-N. Yeah. Elon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Elon of Muscus. And uh, by the way, shout out to my good friend, uh, Stacy out in Toronto, who does an excellent cosplay of that. Uh, also, he says, oh, Born I has something to do with the dreaded Omega particles from Voyager. Seven reacted to them as if they were divine in their purity and power. The Omega Directive is the episode, he says. Um, a line I missed, he says, has, says, act like an Armis. And Armis was the character in Skin of Evil that killed Tasha Yar. That's interesting. He says that's twice now the writers re referenced him. The other is Lower Decks, right? When they crank called uh, Armis. Also, we had, did you notice the changeling uh, mm -hmm. that was like, that kind of had the smoothed out face like Odo. So it might be similar race, although it looked a little bit different. So who knows if it's just a similar race she's the black changeling that's what i wrote down i was like this is black changeling <laughs> nice we represent I'm here uh he also says the vent oh he says that there are other changeling races one was um imon species uh from star trek 6 the undiscovered country check that out actually i'll just show you this one very quickly as well there you go that was in Star Trek 6, The Undiscovered Country. She was also a changeling, different race of changeling. And uh, the last one is the Vendonians from the animated series, The Survivor, also seen in Lower Decks. Anyway, uh, he did say lastly, I missed you like a Cardassian misses cake. He says he doesn't get the reference, but he thinks that you and I might, I think, I think there was nothing more to it. I, I don't know anything about Cardassian cake. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, they miss cake at all. So I think that's a, a <laughs> maybe cake. <-o. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't get that at all myself. I was like, um, Cardassian cake is this missing something. Um, but we had a triple as well. There was a triple in this episode. Yeah, right? the changeling changed into a triple to escape. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, of all things to change into, the most defenseless, harmless thing in the world would not be the thing that I would change into. Nope. You know, like that guy Edward from uh from the, the short treks episode would be like, yum, they're mostly meat, he says, like giant meatballs. <laughs> so um we are going to go to our free-for-all in just a second here. But before we do, we'd like to give a very special thanks to Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet TJ Skillet. Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Bay. Victor Arukin, uh, Yvette, Arukin. Yvette Blackman, Black. Tom, uh, Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy, New Eve, Yeezy. England, out in Wales. Wales. 
Dr. Anne Marie <laughs> Siegel, <laughs> Tim Baum, <laughs> Titus Moeller, Darlena Marie, John Mann. Who? John Mann. Uh, Rex John Mann. A. Wood, Dr. Muhammad <laughs> Noor, of course, Joe Balserati, Tierney C. Diekman, Michelle Deekman. Melendez. Actually, it's pronounced kind of the French way. Michelle Melendez, Ooh. Marcia Classic Schreier, Anna Post, who is joining us in a second, Jenna Appleton, Dr. Frank Sobozhensky, and especially Dr. Susan V. Gruner. We will see on the other side on the free-for-all. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. You may or may not know, you may or may not care, but my name is Ryan T. Husk. We are joined by uh, Melissa Longo, Anna Post, and Homer Freezy out somewhere on the Bridge of the Discovery. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's just get right back into it. Sirach, you were saying you had a point you wanted to make. Uh, Yes, in this episode, I felt like there was a moment between Colbert and Stamets when they were having their moment where they were bringing up book. I felt like book being gone was causing some kind of thing. And I I wondered if there was some feelings there for book um, that were, that they were trying to to kind of touch upon or not. And if I was, if I was, that was something in my head or if you guys caught that as well. I'm not really sure what you mean, to be honest. I think it seemed, mean, it seemed like, like oh. in a romantic sense. I felt like that. Yeah. I felt oh. like they were alluding to that in the conversation. Okay. Uh, I, thought, um, I thought maybe it was more the fact that he had counseled him and it was like personal. that closeness of like the client patient relationship and, um, he had counseled him and been going through problems himself. And I thought maybe it was more his own sense of having failed book or the ship and that he didn't, he didn't realize in these intimate counseling sessions. And he had thought that he had broken through with book and like helped him that, that book just like jumped ship. And he hadn't, he hadn't seen that coming. And I I thought that it was more alluding to that book. There's, it was a very personal situation. It wasn't just like, oh, another guy goes off and does something, you know, like he was having these these personal sessions with Booker that were, you know, counselor and patient, but also friend to friend, right? Right. And, and part of that may have been like Colbert feeling like he failed in his counseling that, that let Booker just go off and do what he wanted to do because he wasn't as effective as he thought he was supposed to be. Mm. What do you guys think of a counselor also being the chief medical officer? It sounds like that double duty is too much for one person. I agree. And the strain is showing. (laughs) (laughs) Your strain is showing. It is. Um, yeah. I, 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 you guys. Well, when I am upset or preoccupied or whatever Culber was, I don't clean. I, I do something <laughs> else. That struck me as odd. And plus, just kind of like wiping the sides of the couch and then going somewhere else is like, that's not even effective. What is he? Doing? <laughs> anyway, you, you tell him over. His, that is his not a cleaning good way to technique clean. is well, bad. <laughs> I do know people who clean when they are frustrated. No. I am not one of those people, but, but no. I do know they people could, who do. They could give Colbert lessons on how to do it effectively, I think. Well, yes. I don't think he's had much practice because that robot seems to do it all. <laughs> he was zhuzhing. He was yeah. zhuzhing. His own words. He said, I'm not cleaning, I'm zhuzhing. <laughs> Well, that's I just, would just think I, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's just a little bit of added insight into what makes each character special. They all have like their little isms, you know, what they do when they're stressed or what they do when they're happy or whatever. It was just an, an added little thing. And it's these kind of details that we love as fans to get to know the characters a little bit better. But uh, what were you saying, Sirach? 
Um, I was going to ask about other Star Treks and the people that are the, you know, the psychological support. I yeah. think like Guinan was in, in Next Generation, right? Mm-hmm. Or was it, was Troy. it Counselor Troy? Troy? It was both of oh. them, right? Yeah, Guinan was in a in a non official capacity. She was more like she. What, her thing was she listens. So she was like the friend that you go to talk to. Counselor Troy was like the official ship's counselor. And my question, I guess, is, um, what do we usually see the mental state of those characters? Are they usually like solid bedrock people that are not? too easily or are they people that are emotionally sensitive and in some in some cases fragile i don't i don't know if we've i mean other than counselor troy and actually guinan in the same series we haven't really seen counselors i know on ds9 they mentioned esri. going to a counselor I mean, esri. Esri. No. esri oh esri yeah but um, that doesn't happen until the last mm-hmm. season. Um, mm-hmm. Voyager, they lament the fact that they don't have a counselor. And the doctor sort of does try to take some of that on, as does Tuvok in different, with like bulk and meditation and different tries. Mm-hmm. But it's never quite official and often when the doctor does it, it, it can go wrong. Um, and, I, you know, it might even back up that, like, mental health and physical health while related are very different mm. fields and approaches yes. and it's not mm-hmm. it's not the same training um mm-hmm. and it's not the same um skill sets and approaches and things and i think it would be very hard unless and and there are other doctors on board so i can see taking counseling lessons and going into that field because you do still a lot of counselors have to have a medical degree so maybe we don't realize that he he has more of a background and did get his medical degree but also like i don't know minored in mental health or something so right. maybe he has mm-hmm. like a neurological background but Good point. I just feel like it's it's just a lot of work for one person to do. You can't be the chief medical officer and the counselor. I think it would be awesome if Dr. Pollard got a little love in that regard. There, right. but that would be really fun too. Uh, yeah. You look like you're going to say something, Homer. I was. I was just thinking how fun it would be for Jet Reno to be the counselor. <laughs> oh, that would be kind of cool, yeah. though. I mean, yeah. she did counsel Stamets and Colbert at one point beautifully yeah yeah Yeah. and then then the other thing i think that the we enjoy seeing the counselors that are screwed up in their personal life or that don't have confidence because you have a really confident smooth counselor say troy then it's not quite so interesting for us because we know with esri she wasn't quite ready to do it but she did it anyway and culber you know, I was thinking about Culber and why, and maybe it's just because nobody really gets hurt in Discovery, except for Oo had the, you know, the scratch from her her fight. Mm-hmm. So maybe Culber doesn't have a lot to do, and so they said, "Hey, why don't you be the <laughs> counselor as well?" Well, Burnham got hurt when Book left. She did. She her really feelings, did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And did yeah. she talk to Culber? I don't Maybe think so not really. She should have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it is kind of a big all-encompassing job to, you know, take care it of is. people's health, both medically, uh, physically and emotionally. Yeah. And I think it might be new territory for Culver. So he he is a little yep. unsure of what he he's is. doing, but he's feeling his way through it. So uh, I get that, but Zora but, would also be a good choice. Yeah, kind oh, of. Oh no, in a way, but she's kind also the, of, the biggest but, wreck of them all, too, though. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. A baby. Like, like they go to but, see her, but she ends up crying and telling them why she's upset. <laughs> or go watch some <laughs> and movies. shuts down the shields. <laughs> yeah. Shields offline. Uh, <laughs> but I don't understand why. Come on, they Zora. <laughs> I don't understand why they wouldn't 
just bring on a counselor to to Ooh. help the crew out, especially since they've all been through kind of a traumatic change. Yeah. From going yeah. from the past to the future. There's got to be counselors. Totally. In the future, yeah. too, in Starfleet. So I don't know why they wouldn't bring on a new one. Plus, we all know that the best counselor would be Linus. <laughs> oh, that would be cool. <laughs> well, be, I wonder if, for that. Yeah. It makes me wonder, too, because I'm, oh, my God, I'm blanking on the name right now. But um, Holograph Counselor, I mean, he was sort of medical and mental as well. Was Rio? it Kovic? Kovic? Kovic. Oh, 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 the guy that got it. Because he he was counseling um, Georgio. Colbert. And he was counseling yeah. Giorgio, oh, but he yeah. was also doing the right. physical scans. And he was the one that talked about, like, found the phase differential um, and temporal differential for Giorgio. So even he had sort of a gray mm-hmm. line between medical and mental. Yeah. So maybe, maybe they are in the, you know, far future doing more of a holistic take on medicine where you do Mm. have to study both physical and mental and treat a person as a whole because so many physical or mental things manifest physically or vice versa Mm. um you know they are intricately tied so maybe maybe in the future they have a more treat the whole person whether it's mental or physical um because Mm. it's all part of the same Hey, did you guys catch the Boronite mention and what that mm-hmm. implicates? That is a Voyager deep cut. <laughs> Mega Chronicles. It was mentioned twice. Mm-hmm. Both of them in things getting destroyed in one space station was built partly with Boronite. And then in the Omega directive, it was a Boronite particles. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that we are going to run into the Borg, the 800 years into the future Borg. Oh, that would be interesting. Are they the, are they the race or the group that is mining Boronite to destroy hmm. everything? No, it's species 10 C. Duh. 10 C. <laughs> Weren't and, you but, listening? <laughs> but we don't know that that's what they're mining yeah. the Borite for. And, <laughs> and the Federation <laughs> hasn't had any everything. interaction with 10 C. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. assuming. So, no, the answer is no, I guess. Yeah. We'll see. We'll probably not see. in this context. <laughs> well, at least, <laughs> at least Klingons were mentioned as well. Like we're getting species reference, even if we're not getting species themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's we the heard first of Cardassian. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, Cardassians like a... cake. And we had oh, a yeah. mention of. Um, the Eisenberg. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the highlight of the year right there already. That's we started <laughs> the episode with that. We basically spent 90% of the episode talking about that. We're like, or yeah, we're like, okay, well, we got to get to the rest of this thing. <laughs> and then we talked about poker for the rest of the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Poker has a great tradition and track. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. did you guys have any favorite moments oh go ahead Sarah. yeah my favorite moment is when uh aaron used to say what's up with the aarons with two a's they're a a ron <laughs> like key and peel yeah. like that key and peel thing yeah like that key and peel yeah. thing you don't you messed up now a a ron a <laughs> ron and he he would say it's because moses had a stutter so people got it wrong uh, uh, aaron <laughs> <laughs> there it, it is was, yeah <laughs> i like that i used to love those those moments right there yeah because my dad's name is uh aaron with two a's yeah. so i i told aaron that i'll, I'll you know we that the same name as my dad, except he's a a Ron and you're A-Ron. <laughs> Aaron A-Ron. He's got one A. Your dad's got two A's. Rex has yeah. four A's. When you say Rex mm-hmm. A Wood. A Wood. <laughs> no, but do you guys have any uh, favorite parts of this episode? Anything that jumped out? Did you love that uh, Has character? 
Yeah. Was uh, makeup character. was cool. Makeup was cool. I don't know who the actor was. Me neither. Um, I did like the part where Burnham got let her guard down when she was playing poker. When she was like oh, yeah. sassy. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like that part. I like sassy Burnham. <laughs> yeah. I was trying yeah, to like figure that. out what were the fake like the signals to each other and yep. what were just them the tapping. Yeah. Yeah. The tapping, oh, I think the, the oh, hand. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Stealing I thought signs. When, like, she had a hand yeah. up, and then he put a hand up and she put her hand down. I thought maybe uh-huh. that was one of them. That was fun. Like that whole game was pretty fun. Mm-hmm. But I think it's interesting how other alien races somehow adopt human objects like chips <laughs> yeah like chips and poker i, I mean i don't know if you were if you were the props department what would you use instead of chips jacks uh, I, I don't know some kind of something different like like Tic-tacs. i don't know some kind of small i don't know kind of stone type thing i don't know that's colorful it even, yeah it, it doesn't even have like, to be a physical object in this world or this time. well that's true too that's true too it could be digital they, right yeah mm-hmm. it'd be digital they could have all the sounds and everything and it would keep track perfectly of the score so you know exactly how much is in the oh, pot yeah mm-hmm. so it's more difficult to cheat too yeah. Yeah, I thought of the same thing, Melissa. I was thinking, how many games have made it throughout the, like, how long will poker last? Will poker be around five hundred years from now? Will, and uh, we've seen chess has lasted through the ages, and and it's mm-hmm. referenced in Star Trek. Um, but like, you know, darts, for example, in DS Nine, like how these games that we're used to seeing, racquetball, whatever, basketball, like, will they be around five hundred or a thousand years from now? Or will they be replaced by other things? Well, and but they kind of make sense in the the context of the original shows because darts was a big thing in the UK in for the human species. So I can see O'Brien introducing that as you know something just like Cisco's introducing baseball. It's kind of American Mm -hmm. heritage and and he's from, you know, the U.S. I was just wondering how alien civilizations a thousand years in the future are adopting things from human history Mm -hmm. in, you know, into their Mm -hmm. day to day. I mean, I guess it's possible, but it just seems like chips. I don't know. Would would uh, evolve a little bit. <laughs> Vegan chips, well, more like Pringles. It it could be that the what was it Lagarin poker or something? Maybe it's a colony as opposed to a different species. So it's oh. possible it's still like. And I just mm-hmm. it just occurred mm-hmm. to me that it it could just be like like five card stud. It could just be a different version of poker that gets played on this one world. But it doesn't necessarily mean they weren't, you know, of like a Federation colony. It, uh, it was the uh, Leonian. Yeah. It could also yeah, be Leonian. that it could also be that just this thing evolved on its own planet. And when the Federation met this race and they saw them playing, they're like, oh, that's just like poker. It's like we'll call it Leonian poker. You know, it's yeah. like mm. you, you see something that's similar to what you have. And we just kind of say, well, it's their version of it's like leonian poker you know hmm. something like that well I'll, I'll say that it didn't have the same structure as poker that we normally play because there was only two cards in both yeah, like blackjack it yeah. was more like black but they had the cards in the middle so it was like a yeah. version of poker where you play was... your two cards and it's oh like i didn't see that I didn't see yeah that. they had the line up yeah. in the center of the table so everybody had their cards plus those oh so like a I no limit was... no no limit poker like... Yeah. Yeah, like Texas, Texas Hold'em, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, Interesting. So my question kind for of. everybody, here's my question for you guys. If you're a changeling, 
and you're <laughs> I know back you're into say. a corner. <laughs> what are you changing into? And don't say triple because that answer has been used already. <laughs> I say that was the fastest moving triple ever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back into uh, a, a corner. Uh. Yeah. What, uh, Melissa, you, what are you changing into? Something, something different, right? Something that flies. <laughs> An Albanian condor. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> something that flies really, really fast that uh, I could probably even fly into like a, a little tiny rocket ship <laughs> right. or something. But yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I'm backed into a corner and I need to get out of that corner and the best answer that zippy triple is off, then I would do like, um, I don't know what my planet is, but a stegosaurus or a rhinoceros and just. Yeah. Right there. All right. <laughs> out of the way. Yeah. And then right. I could change it to something else that was fast, Ooh. maybe with a prehensile tail. Or maybe like nice. some kind of liquid. Because you can't catch just yes, can just like become you know, a part of the wall in the corner and then just like slide yeah, the wall get out yeah, That's okay. yeah. I could just ooze through seep a, great yeah. yeah seep into the cracks and just yeah. pop or out the other side smoke mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> smoke options. smoke goes out the window those that people will definitely <laughs> uh, well uh, we got to run everybody that was a fun one. Uh, I didn't come up with an answer. What's your answer, Srock? I I'm gonna have to go with Melissa. I'd probably go with the liquid, and find my what you know find a way to just like pour myself into the next room. <laughs> or you Something could just like, like turn in. Sponge. You could turn into the people yeah. that are trying to catch you. So they're like, you arrest that man. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm the real. <laughs> and then it turns into a buddy cop show. Uh, all right. Well, let's. Move it along, everybody. Thank you very much, Homer, Anna, and Melissa for joining in. Everybody at home, thank you for playing along with us. Sirach, myself, and the guy that got ships named after him, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>